we are on a new sermon series called Reloaded. Everyone say Reloaded. Reloaded. Right? Reloaded, it's time. It's mid-year. This is midterm. This is half time. I know in January there are some individuals that, uh, that, that create a New Year's resolution and everybody wants to go to gym. You go to gym in January, everybody's back at the gym on a weight diet and on trying to gain some, some muscle mass, right? And, uh, and then you get to like the second week of January and now your game plan has changed a little bit. You stop on uh, the way to the gym at the wing stop right next door. How many of y'all think that wing stop is anointed of the Lord? Right? I think there's something wrong in my car because every time I get by the wing stop, the steering wheel starts pulling in that direction. I don't know what's going on. I got to get that checked out. But uh, we're at halftime, right? We're halfway through the year and there's no time for discouragement to set in on your life. If it doesn't look like you thought it would look in January or how things might change by February or, or how things continue to go in the same way that they went last year, you are still at a good time to say, okay, I got to put some things into action to ensure that I'm in partnership with the heavens and making sure that because there hasn't been some change, that there hasn't been some change because you have not changed with it. Mm. So... So we're supposed to be celebrating Pentecost today. How many of y'all celebrating, understanding the whole Pentecost deal, right? That was in the upper room. Everybody broke out in tongues, right? They call us tongue talkers and charismatic and all of that stuff. And how many of y'all enjoy Pentecost? Right? We love Pentecost. We love the services where folks are at the altar, filling the altar up with all this snot. We love you put hands on folks and folks slain all over the place and everybody speaking in tongues. And ah, how many of y'all like those services? Well, you know, I haven't put a whole lot of emphasis in celebrating Pentecost this year because I realize that we do a lot of celebrating and no recognizing. See, celebrating, we get into a place where we go to an event and we want the gift, but we don't want the gift giver. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So we want the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, but we don't want Holy Spirit in our life. Why? Because he brings all of these convictions and all of these things that cause us to get right on track with God. And so we want all of his stuff. We want all of the blessings and we want the healing and we want the manifestation, but we leave very little room for the giver of the gift. I think we're in a season now where we ought to be recognizing the Holy Spirit more than, than celebrating the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes, folks coming into an environment like this, experience an amazing worship like that, and they leave the same way that they came in. What are we celebrating? People going, coming to a place and to a good service and still on a path to hell? We have to ensure that we know what it is that we're getting ourselves into. See, this entire month to me and to the team, we're on a journey because the month of July, the services, all eight services, two services per Sunday, we will be focused more on worship and celebrating who God is and inviting the sick inviting the people that are needing healing, inviting the people that their marriage is on a brink, inviting people that need breakthrough in their life. And, and at that point, there will be a people that are prepared and will be as pillars ready to receive folks that are looking and that we can provide to them what it is that they're looking for. Some folks are looking for hope but don't know what to find it in. Some of us look at, uh, uh, for hope in men and some of us look for hope in women and some of us are looking for hope in substance and some of us are looking for hope and money but I want to let you know that your hope is in Christ Jesus and I don't even believe that the church relies on the hope of Jesus we just want a feel good this and a feel good that and tell me a little bit on how all the blessings were right down all my life and and we get to prophesying I mean prophesying and and we just got to get to a place where we are recognizing the Holy Spirit and not just wanting his stuff See, Pentecost is a rebirth of Holy Spirit in man. It's not the birth of the Holy Spirit. It's not the first time that we hear about the Spirit in the Bible. 
In fact, you can read in the book of Genesis and it says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the earth and he began to establish and call order. When God created Adam and Eve and then he, would, he was walking in the garden, they were in communication, they were in a relationship, but there was something that happened. Adam and Eve, uh, <coughs> Eve ate first, first of all. <laughs> But something happened immediately. There was, there was an action that occurred that had a cause and effect. The cause and effect was something like this. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And God goes into the garden and he says, Adam, Eve, where are you? At that moment, there was a separation between man and the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God was saying, where are you? Not because he was looking for them in a geographical location. He was looking for them because they were lost now in regards to a decision that they made what we are celebrating is a rebirth of the spirit of God in man and understanding that sin will separate us from God and so we want to celebrate the tongue talking day of Pentecost the 50th day after the resurrection of Jesus we want to celebrate the Holy Spirit suddenly falling on them in the upper room we want to celebrate that but here's the reality the Holy Spirit falling on humanity yet again in that fashion uh, immediately after Peter preached the message and 3,000 people were saved. See, we have an amazing service. Folks laid out all over the place, but not one salvation and everybody leaves the same way they came in. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so there's a cause and effect. We're not looking for a good service. We're looking for transformation. There's a transformation that needs to begin to happen in the body. But this is what happens. We get comfortable with the hush money that the devil gives to us. Well, what do you mean, Pastor G? This is what I mean. Every once in a while, we step into a little bit of blessing and we say it's from God, but God is nowhere in it. The devil allowed you to reap a little bit to keep you on the same track and in the same path, but God is nowhere in the midst of it and so you keep going thinking you're a-okay but the reality is is that God is nowhere near the picture and then you wonder why is there no change in my life why do I keep seeking God why do the same things continue to happen why because every room in your temple is filled with the stuff that should not be in there and there is no space for God to do anything different why because you got it filled up with the same old same old I'm preaching really good right now and I need for y'all to match the type, of, the type of shouting on that side that I'm doing on this side. It's hard. <laughs> Sin causes a separation. And we could see that in the Garden of Eden, there was a separation between man and the Spirit of God. And one was hiding while the other one was seeking. The Holy Spirit is seeking after you. I know we come to church and we say, I found God. No, you didn't find God. He was never lost. You were. I found God. No, you didn't find him. He was seeking you out. He's been knocking on the door of your heart, and you have finally allowed him to come on in. But I want to let you know that you could be at the church house and still really far away from God. Now, I'm nowhere near perfect. I'm not where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I, I used to be. Come on. There's got to be a progression, and I'm marching up feeling I'm going to have a bad day, and I'm, I'm going to slip up sometimes, and I'm, I'm going to say some things that I ought not to say. And There's going to be moments that are unholy moments, but in the end, I may not be where I want to be, but thank God. Come on, you got to celebrate those things, and God can work with that, but don't ask God to bless your mess. Now, I'm going to give you all a mouthful here. Are you all ready? Now, how many English majors do we have in the house? One, one English major, wow, the rest of us, we need, can, can you give us some English classes? So re, when the, the prefix re is before a word, prefix means before the word, what does that mean? It means do it again. It means we got to go back, right? That there's a re that needs to happen in our life, and I need y'all to write this down. I'll repeat it twice, and then that's it. After that, I'm going to charge you for it. Are you ready? 
we must address some lifestyle choices to reestablish and reconnect. We must refresh to re-experience the Spirit of God, and we must remove what keeps us from recognizing so that we can give space to the Holy Spirit in our lives. I'm going to repeat it one more again. We must address some lifestyle choices. Can you think about the lifestyle choices that you must address in your life? You must address some lifestyle choices to reestablish. Establish means firm and permanent basis and reconnect. We must refresh to re-experience the Spirit of God. We must remove what keeps us from recognizing. Cognizing means uh, perceive, know, become aware of so that we can give space to the Holy Spirit. Some of us are giving space to everything else. Some of us are giving time and attention to everything else. Some of us are giving uh, uh, free space in our minds to things and people that you should have evicted a long time ago. And we must begin to give some eviction notices and let go of those things that distract us from what can really bring us into the breakthroughs of our life. See, the devil knows about squatter laws. Anybody knows what a squatter law is? That's when you let somebody stay at your house, and the moment that they receive one piece of mail at your house, and you want them to go, you literally have to give them a 30-day eviction notice uh, uh, before you can kick them out. You could call the, or yeah, you could call the cops if you want to, but the cop is going to say, you have a resident, and you must now give them an eviction notice. You have an eviction, or excuse me, you have a resident up in your space that you must now give an eviction notice to so that you can get a level of freedom that you're desiring and at that point is when the Holy Spirit can then move in. See, we want to celebrate Pentecost and we want to celebrate the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, but, but we really don't know the Holy Spirit. We just know what he is capable of doing and to some of us, that's just good enough. But no, I don't, I'm not so concerned with the gift. I'm concerned with the giver of the gift and if I'm in alignment with him, then I will grab a hold to what he has for me and if I want the gift, then I begin to covet everybody else's gift and we begin to compare ourselves and the comparison brings us to a place that if you understood what it took for me to get here you probably would have quit along the way some of y'all don't know the hell that I've been through to get here but this is what happens when we begin to covet the gift rather than the gift giver let's take a look and investigate 2 Kings somebody say 2 Kings that's after First Kings. That was very theological, right? And so there are three points that I'm going to share with you guys in regards to Second Kings chapter 13 that are going to help and position you to get to a place where you can move forward from the place where you are into a place of freedom and into a better relationship with God. How many of y'all need freedom right now? How many of y'all at a place where you feel like you're in bondage? How many of y'all feel like there's, there's just some things that are going on in your life that just keep you in depression and anxiety and oppression? It's time for us to walk in a level of freedom. It makes no sense for us to continuously walk into a place like this and still allow our minds to be the devil's playground. At some point, there's got to be a progression in our lives and in our children's lives. Otherwise, we allow ourselves to submit to the plan of the enemy and we never, ever, ever step onto the battlefield that God has for us because we're constantly on the wrong, at the wrong location. There was a period of time when I was in Iraq. I didn't tell this story, first story, so you guys get a bonus. There was a period of time when I was in Iraq and there, there, we were on a convoy. I was driving a truck and uh, our, our gunmen were mail clerks. They didn't know where they were taking us to. They took us through one road and we wound up getting attacked. And we fought through this attack and we get to the other side a few miles down the road and these mail clerks look at us and say, Sarge, <laughs> we at the wrong place. We got to turn around. 
guess what we had to potentially experience again? See, this is why we find ourselves experiencing the same battles over and over and over in our lives. Is because we're on the wrong roads, headed to the wrong place. And when we finally realize that we're not where we should be, we got to turn around and go through the same thing that you experienced one time before. And some of us are just kind of like, not this road again, and not these people again. Well, it, it's not them. We can't blame the devil for, for some of our own mishaps. We can't blame the devil because we were looking at our GPS upside down. Second Kings chapter 13. I came to preach, y'all. I came to preach. So there were, there were three kings in the book of of second kings that were, uh, they were evil kings and they were leading the Israelites in the wrong direction to do evil things and they were worshiping all of these false idols, right? And so let's start reading. Second kings chapter 13 verse 4 through 6. So Jehoahaz pleaded with the Lord and the Lord listened to him for he saw the oppression of Israel because the king of Syria oppressed them. Then the Lord gave Israel a deliverer. That sounds good up to this point, right? There's a king that sees the oppression. Then God delivers to them or brings to them a deliverer so that they escape from under the hand of the Syrians. Sounds really good, right? And the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before. They went back to the life that they knew. Verse 6, nevertheless, they did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who had made Israel sin, but walked in them, and the wooden image also remained in Samaria. Point number one, deliverance takes work. Point number one, deliverance takes work. See, some of us, we understand that there's a level of deliverance that needs to take, uh, take a, a grip of us in our household. We understand that there's some dysfunctions that need to change in our lives. We can see that our family through the bloodline has passed down some things to us, and I wish we would have inherited some finances, but all we've inherited is generational curses. <laughs> we continue to deal with the same stuff that they've dealt with and we have come to a place where finally we understand and have some common sense that there needs to be a deliverance that will break the generational curses and what has come to me I can break it and not pass it down to my children are y'all with me so far and then God in his sovereign way and he is so righteous and he is so just he brings the deliverance that you've been asking of him are y'all with me so far but this is what happens that some of our behaviors do not match the deliverance that has taken place in our lives and we think that deliverance is for a lifetime deliverance just means that you're free right now but what you did to get free you must continue to do to stay free are y'all hearing what I'm saying See, we want God to bring deliverance and we want God to bring freedom, but we want to act just like they did. We want to reside like they did. We want to spend it up like they did. And we want to go to the places that they went through. And we think of like, well, my God brought deliverance in my life and you were free for that moment, baby. But you just went back to the same demons that they brought you to. We got to work for deliverance. Every single day of our lives, we have to pick up our cross daily. We must die to self daily so that we can continue to stay free. See, there's individuals that I know have fought through addiction, and every day they got to fight through addiction. There are smells and scents and things that bring them back to the place that they once knew, and they got to run from those things. Otherwise, they can submit right back to that thing that had them bound before. We got to work daily. We got to work hard. Deliverance is something that we must work to maintain. There is a sustaining grace that we grab onto and we cannot go back because some of us, if we go back, we die. There's no way that you can go back to the lifestyle and the things because you won't make it out again. Why would we want to go back to the things that have depressed us? Why would we want to go back to the things that have left us, left us lifeless and have suffocated us and made us feel like we were underwater, but yet we find ourselves going right back to the things that we've become free from. I can't go back to that stuff. I can't even play around with that stuff. Why? It brings me right back to a thought that, that if I don't get away from it as quickly as possible, it's going to suck me right on in. Deliverance. You got to work hard for it. 
and you got to work hard for it to be maintained. Point number two, some things you have to put to death. See, we leave too many bridges open for us to cross back over. We leave too many relationships up in place just in, cl- just in case we got to cross that, bir- that bridge yet again. So we, we allow things to just linger in our lives just a little bit. Why? Because we talk about plan B. Somebody say plan B. Listen, if you have a plan B in your life, it has become your new plan A. You've already decided in your heart and your mind that you were going to fail at plan A. So you had to create a backup plan and your backup plan has now become your main priority plan. And so we got to get to a place where we cut, we got to cut some things. We got to cut it off. We got to cut it free. We got to raise some numbers. We got to break some phones. We got to, we got to throw away some address books. We got to, there's some music that we, that brings us back to that place. We got to cut it off. Off. Why? Because if you continue to keep that bridge, what is it going to do? It's going to take you back. There's some music that takes you right on back to where you used to be. How many of y'all remember a song even right now? Don't even think about it. Come on back. <laughs> There's some things that we have to cut off otherwise you leave access for yourself to go on back over see there are individuals that have beat addiction and the way that they went back is they hung around somebody that was an addict an addict or or relationships that you were held down and bound down by and now you find a new relationship that is the same way and now you're right back into the same pattern as before listen you got to break away and cut it at the root otherwise you cross that bridge yet again this is what scripture tells us in second kings chapter 13 verse 14 through 17 now elisha had been suffering from the illness from which he died Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to him and wept over him. My father, my father, he cried, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And verse 15 says, Elisha said to him, get a bow and and get some arrows. And he did. And take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. When he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. He told him, open the east window, he said. And he opened it. Shoot, Elisha said. And he shot. And the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Raham or uh, Aram. And Elisha declared, you will completely destroy the Arameans and Aphek. See, the oppression that was going on in their life, the Israelites were, were being oppressed by Syria. And he says, listen, go ahead and shoot this arrow, the arrow of victory. And the things that have been oppressing you, you will destroy. The things that have been keeping you bound, the people that have been having a control over you, those folks that have been operating under the spirit of Jezebel in your life that have been holding you down and bound. Listen, this arrow of victory is a word from the Lord that you will destroy the oppressor not just let them go not just talk to them not not talk to them not just give them the silent treatment not just turn a blind eye to them or, or or check them up on social media after you've unfriended them no it is a complete annihilation a complete destruction there are bridges that you saints of God must burn Otherwise, you will cross them again. And it hurts because these may be some people that you really love. But listen, that bridge, if you don't burn it, they're just going to bring you back. And there's some things that you may have a high value for. But in my opinion, ain't nothing worth me going to hell for that I got to hold on to. We got to. We got to burn some bridges. Can you think of some of the things that you got to burn some bridges on right now? Or there's some people that that you just got to completely disconnect from because they continue to pull you back mentally and physically. And your body becomes so sick because of what you're going through mentally. Listen, it's a time that we we stop being afraid of cutting things off and people off because we're we're afraid of what they're going to think or what they're going to say. But I'm letting you know right now that if you hold on to it, it's going to do nothing more than begin to cripple your body. Listen, stress will do some things to you. You got to burn the bridge. And lastly, you got to break from the mindset of the past. 
See, our own inadequacies keep us from taking full advantage of the doors that God has for us. See, based on how you think of yourself, that is the standard of which you live. Depending on how you view yourself, when, that, when you are looking right in that mirror, that will determine the lifestyle that you will allow yourself to live. See, a lot of times, well, how you doing? Oh, the devil is really just, no, the devil ain't doing nothing. It's how you view in yourself. It's a standard of which you're living. It's where you allow yourself to go and what you allow yourself to do. Here's a, a, a quick uh, tip for you. Uh, have you ever heard of self-sabotaging? See, some of us don't feel like we can do any better, so we don't allow ourselves to do better. And we wind up elimin eliminating ourselves from opportunities that God has for us, or, or we eliminate people that should be in our life because we don't feel like we they should be in our corner and over and over and over we self-sabotage and we blame everything and everyone else when the problem is the problem is you the problem is you we go on and, and Elisha told him, listen, open up the east window. Shoot that arrow. That's the arrow of victory. You will completely destroy your oppressors. It was clear. Then we get down to verse 18 through 20. It says, then he said, take the arrows. And the king took them. And Elisha said to him, strike the ground. And he struck the ground three times and stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you will only defeat it three times. And then Elisha died and was buried. See, oftentimes God is trying to give us opportunity, but we only do as far or as much as we feel like we can do. See, God is trying to give you much more, and you ask for the, the smaller amount. And God is saying, listen, I'm willing to give you the city, and you're just kind of asking for a little one-bedroom trailer. And we, God is saying, I'm trying to give you steak, and you're just happy with a good little wiener from, from 7-Eleven. And off the, over and over and over, listen, we're constantly... Uh, minimizing what God is trying to do for you. Why? Based off of your own mindset. Well, you know, well, you know what people think about me. Well, you know what they say about me. You know my life and you know my upbringing and you know how things are and you know how church folks are. No, hogwash. It's your own mindset. You are not doing what God told you to do, not because of anyone else, not because of that pastor or those church people or family members or your friends. Listen, it's because of because of you it's because of you so let me give you a little bit of of pastor G's background so I grew up in, in New York City most of you know and I grew up in the ghetto in the hood in the housing authority in my neighborhood the drug dealers would be shooting at each other. Everybody just hit the ground. Anybody ever see the movie New Jack City? That was my life. It was the crack pandemic, the epidemic of crack. There were crack vials all over the place. There was one dude one time that he was being shot at, and he grabbed a baby as he was being shot at and used the baby as a shield, and the baby wound up getting shot. These are the things that I witnessed growing up as a child. I'm of the era when food stamps were dollars. Some of y'all might know that. Y'all just look at the card now and now, baby. It used, to be, it used to be paper. And the greater the value, the bigger the dollar. And in New York, you could buy Chinese food with that stuff. You could go to, to the store. I mean, you could buy whatever you wanted with that stuff. It's a little bit different now. And so I lived... And my parents, they struggled with addiction. Some of y'all have heard me say this before. I lived according to the standard in which I knew as a child growing up. I applied for jobs according to what I knew growing up. I was intimidated by a certain class of people. 
I would be really quiet against some, around some folks that I thought that just were more prestige than I. My, my standard of how I understood life was just, it was a poverty mindset. I was a little project kid that grew up in New York City that probably wasn't going to amount to anything. I was voted least likely to succeed. I was not a good kid growing up. And that's how I lived my life. And people could speak over me and prophesy and say this and say that. And it was just, that was, it was too far-fetched for me to understand. Then I had somebody pour into my life. Began to show me that, you know what, I can. I can do it. That there is a word on the inside of me for a time like now. That I don't have to limit myself to, to just a, a, a small paying job or a job that's going to break my back. That I can apply for things that, 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 that I may not even qualify for. But because of the favor of heaven that God would allow me to step into some things that God had for me. And doors that he had for me. That no man ought to intimidate me. Not because of who I am, but because of what's on the inside of me. See, I would have been like this king. Take the arrow, Pastor Jean, strike it into the ground. And I might have just probably would have just struck it into the ground one time, thinking that was going to be enough. But I realized something. That what God has spoken, man cannot minimize. What God has spoken over your life, God, no, no man can minimize. Not even you. Not even you. And it doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what's in your bank account. It doesn't matter uh, your, 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 your social capital, your economic capital. It doesn't matter what it looks like right now. It doesn't look, matter what it looked like before. What God has ahead for you is what he has for you. And there's no man, no woman, no person, no thing that can eliminate you from what God has chosen you for. But we got to believe it. The only thing that keeps you from being a contender for God's plan is your sin. Well, you don't know. You don't pay my bills, Pastor G. You don't know my life. It ain't none of your business. Can't nobody tell me what to do. You're right. I can't tell you nothing. But then when things are not working out, then why are you blowing up my phone? You don't want me in your business. See, we want the manifestation. We want all of the good things from heaven. But we got to open up the door for the giver of those things. And it doesn't matter what it's been up to this point. <laughs> God. It doesn't matter what it's looked like up to this point. Today could be the first day of the rest of your life. Are you willing to give God space? Because that will require you to refresh, to re receive, begin to re-experience, so that you can begin to recognize God in your life. We're in a new day and a new day and age, y'all. People are looking for real, raw, and relevant. So we've gotten into the church house and we know how to duplicate Holy Spirit. We know, we know when the right time to crash the cymbals. We know the right time to cup the, mic, the microphone so we can accentuate the voice. And we know the right time to do this and to do that. And Holy Spirit is nowhere in there. We know how to do church really well. But we got to stop playing church and we got to really become a people of God that are representing in a holy way so that God can do in our hour what he is desiring to do. But you got
got to make space. You got to make space. Are you willing to make space? Are, we, are you willing to let go of some things? Are you willing to burn some bridges? Are you, are you willing to, to destroy some things in your life that need to be destroyed? Are you willing to do that? Because if you're not, then you've enjoyed a good service, but you'll leave the same way that you came in. And if you're okay with that, then we just got to let you be. But God is desiring more from you. You got to want more from you and yourself. Every head bowed and every eye closed. This is the first call that I would like to make. If there's anyone here in this place that is saying, you know what, I just want to make Jesus Lord and Savior of my life. I don't know what this looks like, and my life is far from perfect. I got so many things going on, I don't even know where to begin. He's talking about all these rooms, and all my rooms are filled right now. But I, but I want to start at just getting to know who Jesus is. And if that's you, and you just want to make Jesus Lord and Savior of your life, and you just want day one to be today, just slip up your hand right where you are. We won't embarrass you. I see that hand right here. In the front, is there anyone else that would say, you know what, I, I want Jesus to be Lord and Savior of my life. Maybe you're watching us online and you're saying, you know what, I want this Jesus. Just put up a number one and, and let us recognize you. Is there anyone else in here that would say, you know what, I want Jesus in my life. Perhaps you're in this place and you've fallen away. The church has hurt you. Something's happened. Maybe you've been distracted by things of this world and you're saying, you know what, I'm ready to come on back home and give this another try. If that's you, just step up your hand. Is there anyone else in this place? Let's support our sister here. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, today I accept you as Lord and Savior of my life. I ask that you forgive me of my sins and that you allow me to walk according to your will and purpose, God. Fill every room in my heart, God. In the name of Jesus, amen. Maybe you're in here and you're saying, you know what, there's some rooms in my life that you need to provide an eviction notice to what's in there. Is there anyone in here that would just say, you know what, there's some people that are taking up too much space, too much residence in my mind, and I need to give them an eviction notice. Is there anyone in here? Just stand up right where you are. Just, that's you. Just stand up right where you are. Just make a public confession. Stand up right where you are. Maybe there, there's some rooms where, where there's addictions that, that are taking place in your life, and, and you can't stop. Uh, looking at stuff that you shouldn't or maybe doing some things that you shouldn't. Maybe this is you and you need to go ahead and just maybe there's some rooms filled with like just some depression and anxiety and mental health stuff and, and you just, you did it's just been consuming you and maybe that's you. Maybe your marriage is just is, is upside down and those rooms are filled with constant arguing and turmoil. Maybe you need to stand up. Even if you're right in your living room Maybe I didn't call it out, but, but you're sitting at your seat and you're saying, you know what, I want him to call it out so that I can stand up. I know that there's something, but if this is you, any, anything, if there's anything that is filling the spaces of your mind, of your life, just go ahead and stand up. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just repeat these words after me. Dear Jesus, today, under the power and authority of heaven, I declare an eviction notice to those things that have been consuming me. And you begin to call them by name right now. Just begin to say them. The, the, the whatever, the whatever's been consuming you, uh, give the eviction notice to addiction. Give eviction notice to the people that have been consuming you. Just begin to give that thing an eviction notice. You call it by name. This is your temple, your house. And you got to begin to take authority under the name of Jesus. Have you done it? And you say, Holy Spirit, fill that space. Fill that void. And whatever I have evicted today, that it will go to the feet of Jesus. God, I ask you that you give me the power and the boldness not to let that thing back in. 
that, that I know that it will be worse than it is right now. And so I declare under heaven, in the name of Jesus, today I will walk in my freedom. And those things that have tried to keep me bound no longer will have authority over me. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on with authority. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, work in the hearts of every believer in this place, God. Whether they stood up to recognize what they're going through or not, God, I pray right now in Jesus' name that they will leave different than the way that they came in, God. That no longer will they allow the enemy to use their mind as a playing field, Father God. But that you would give them their assignment, that you would give them vision, and that they will begin to walk out all that you have called them to in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And everyone says, amen. Can we give God about five seconds of praise in this place? Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Before they come up, remind me, Kaylin, remind me of your friend's name. Travis. Travis. Travis, 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 Travis. Listen. <clears throat> Sometimes you view yourself as other people view you around you. And you truly know what's on the inside of you, but, but it becomes cloudy and it becomes muddy. Am I, am, am I speaking right? And so the Holy Spirit is just having me to tell you to stop viewing yourself how other people view you. And stop being a people pleaser. Because at the end of the day, the Holy Spirit is saying right now that those people that you're constantly trying to please are only going to turn their back on you anyway. Walk under the authority that, that God has for you. It doesn't matter what has been up to this point. But today, today is a new day. And it doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect. You're going to walk out of here and there's going to be some things that you're going to confront. There's going to be issues that are going to be around. Those things that you have even been going through, they're not going to go away. What I'm saying right now is there's not a magic formula saying that it's just going to go away. But God is saying this, that you got to continue to view yourself as he created you. Not how, how other people have seen. And as a matter of fact, there's going to be some changes that are going to take place in your life. And there's going to be some people that are going to try to remind you of who you were. And you tell them that, that Terrence, right? That Terrence, he doesn't live here anymore. In Jesus' name. Guys, thank you so much for being a part of our service on today. Listen, if you have any prayer needs, we would love to pray with you. So send them on over. Our hope and desire is that the message was an impact to you and your children and your entire household. We take our motto here seriously. Why do life alone? Listen, there's no reason why you should do life alone. So come and be a part of do us. Let's do life together. <laughs>